Hi, you're listening to Radio Nera on uh, 1490 AM or 99.9 FM HD4 or 101.9 FM. This is Health Beyond Borders. I'm your host, Abhi Cherakuri, and today we'll be taking a holistic and inclusive approach to health as we discover and explore other medical practices around the world in hopes of improving our own health care or improving your own daily life. With us today, I have Dr. Archana Parashotham, an assistant professor of neurology here at Baylor College of Medicine and the director of the Headache Center at the Michael E. DeBakey Veterans Affair Medical Center, or MedVac for short. Thank you so much, Dr. Archana Ji, for taking your time out of your day to spend it with us. Good to be here. I'll be talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just for the listeners here, today we'll be discussing Ayurveda and how it can be incorporated into our lives. And I just want to start off here by asking you how you actually got in touch with Ayurveda, how that, you know, became a huge part of your life. How did that start? How early and, you know, how it became? A sure. So mm-hmm. I was trained entirely in Western medicine. Mm-hmm. So um, Ayurveda is something that uh, you know, it's traditional Indian medicine. It's uh, it's unclear how old. It's several thousand years old. Um, exactly how much we don't know. Um, and uh, Ayurveda, in some form, sort of um, permeates a lot of uh, the Indian lifestyle. So, without realizing it, there were several principles of Ayurveda that um, uh, we all followed. Um, at home. And uh, I came to know, you know, a little more formally about this, um, maybe about um, about 12, 13 years ago. Um, I shouldn't say I came to know, I got a chance to learn more formally about it. Uh, by then, I was a, a stroke neurologist, and I was um, conducting research. And I came across um, you know, uh, I had a chance to work with some Ayurvedic practitioners at a uh, at a um, university hospital in in Bangalore, and uh, then I got very interested in the matter and uh, have been doing some research into it since then. So that's how I got into it. Perfect. The research, which we'll go back to further, is really promising. There's already been a few studies here, but for the listeners who haven't you know, gotten a chance to understand what Ayurveda is. Could you give a broad general uh, description of how Ayurveda might differ from our traditional Western medicine? What are those tenets that it has and how that might be incorporated? Absolutely. So um, Ayurveda is very, uh, uh, I I might say, in one way different in its approach, but in another way, similar to any medicine. So it uses the same, you know, um, history, you take the patient's history, you examine the patient, they have their own methods of examination. Um, uh, Especially the pulse is a big um, aid to uh, diagnosis um, in uh, for many practitioners of Ayurveda, but also many other things. Uh, They look at several clues, um, you know, looking just by observation, and they use that to come to a diagnosis. This is pretty much what we do Mm -hmm. in modern medicine as well. We take a history, we perform an examination, and then using that, and we do perform certain tests um, in the modern day, and then we come to a diagnosis. So it's a similar process they do also. And um, but their understanding of physiology is very different from modern medicine. So Ayurveda uh, looks at all diseases. Um, in fact, I shouldn't say diseases. Only a small part of Ayurveda, I should, you know, is uh, related to disease. There is uh, an, another uh, part which is uh, equally important and. Um, uh, that deals with wellness and how to maintain health. Ayurveda literally translates to the science of longevity. Ayu is lifespan and Veda is knowledge. So it's the knowledge of how to live long and healthy. So a lot of Ayurveda deals with prescriptions for how to be healthy. In fact, the oldest definition of health 
that is known comes from Ayurveda. Um, and it has a very elaborate description of what is good health, which um, in modern medicine, it, you know, me medicine uh, concerned itself mostly with disease for a, a, a long time in history. And it's uh, much more recent that we talk about health, maintaining health and wellness. So, um, uh, yeah, coming back to that, Ayurveda um, looks at all life as consisting of three doshas. So the doshas, so many, the challenges that many of these terms, because it's a completely different idea of the, of the body of physiology, there are no exact translations, but you could think of it as a dosha as um, uh, physiological processes or functions. Mm -hmm. So Ayurveda categorizes all our um, you know, bodily functions and processes into three. These are called the three doshas. Uh, they are kapha, pitta, and vata. So all life requires all three of, of these kinds of functions and processes. But um, all um, any derangement of these processes is leads to disease. And that is how Ayurveda categorizes everything. Um, there are similarities to uh, Ayurveda and several of the traditional Asian medicine, medicinal systems, you know, traditional Chinese. Chinese medicine and this Korean medicine and there are, you know, other places have other traditional medicines and they they all have a lot of uh, um, similarity in their basic principles mm -hmm. and there you will find equivalent for terms used in Ayurveda they will have equivalent terms so that's very interesting because historically they must have had a lot of crosstalk with each other right some type of overlap or communication beforehand right to build that foundation and i think it's really what really interests me about ayurveda is that it's not just once you have a problem once you've encountered a problem it's a solution for your life preventative before and after it's a whole throughout it's a whole lifelong process that's there to actually improve health and that's a focus that we haven't really had in modern medicine like you've mentioned until recently, more about mental health or anything else. So again, very promising on that. In your uh, specific field, how have you seen Ayurveda be possibly introduced? Again, how does Ayurveda look at neurological conditions differently? How is that approach a little different, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so Ayurveda approaches all, all um, physiology and disease in the, with the same three dosha framework. Mm -hmm. So neurology is also approached with the same. Most neurological conditions are considered as disorders of the vata dosha. So mm -hmm. I told you of the three doshas, one of them is vata. So neurological conditions come under the vata vyadi category. Um, and it's, it's uh, interesting, um, you know, I'll give you some, it's hard to explain, you know, that there, because Modern medicine looks at things in a certain way and categorizes things in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And Ayurveda categorizes them quite differently mm -hmm. because they're looking at it according to the these doshas. Right. So let me just give you one simple um, one example from my field. You know, I'm a stroke neurologist, so right. let's talk about that. Um, the condition is called Pakshaghata, okay, in Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. Pakshaghata will would actually means, um, you know, a hemiplegia, meaning difficulty in moving one side mm -hmm. of your body. So that is what Pakshaghata is. Now, uh, hemiplegia is a common manifestation of stroke, right? But not all strokes need to have hemiplegia. Mm -hmm. So when... In Western medicine, we use the word stroke. We're talking of a specific um, mechanism of damage to the brain. Mm -hmm. And that mechanism is simply an interruption of the blood flow. Mm -hmm. So interruption of blood mm -hmm. flow causes that part of the brain to um, die of 
lack of oxygen. And that we call a stroke. It doesn't matter what the manifestations are. If mm -hmm. that affects the motor system, which mm -hmm. controls movement, then you will have paralysis or some abnormal movements. Uh, if it affects the speech area, then that would be still called a stroke, but they may not have the deficits in movement. They may just have difficulties with speech. So mm -hmm. you understand what I mean uh, in that manifestations may be different. Right. Now, Ayurveda, however, Pakshaghata is the diagnosis, and it doesn't matter how that is caused. Mm -hmm. So, um, another example would be multiple sclerosis, right? That right. can also cause hemiplegia, that is, weakness of one side of the body. Mm -hmm. However, when we see a patient with weakness of one side, we are um, fully focused on trying to figure out what what is the um, uh, cause and right. we 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 treat you know that that determines treatment so obviously that that is what we focus on mm -hmm. uh, but ayurveda will first classify it as pakshaghata then they will say was this a sudden occurrence or was this a slow occurrence mm -hmm. was there fever you know various things about what else characterizes that and then treatment is prescribed for those different things. So the, the categorization becomes different. Whereas somebody who has just a loss of speech from stroke right. would not uh, you know, be called pakshaghata in the sense of they have not lost that moment. So there are differences therefore in these kinds of classifications. Uh, um, so I hope that kind of um, no, no. Again, with, with Western medicine, we look a lot in terms of the severity of each symptom. And based on that severity of those symptoms, we then decide to classify it in each category. And it really opens up what each condition is, or it makes it a lot messier. But again, with Ayurveda, it's again, trying to look at the problem, look directly at the source there and trying to synthesize that whole history. So no, that's a great explanation. Thank you so much. Um, Moving forward, let from... me give you. Yeah. Sorry, uh, let me just tell you one more thing while we are on the topic of Pakshaghatta, right? right? So, um, although I, as I told you, it is considered a disease of the Vata dosha, right? But uh, you can have, uh, and very often, it is not just one dosha which is, uh, you know, deranged. Mm -hmm. There is often a contribution of. Uh, the other doshas too. So the way they would look at it is, so sometimes when you have stroke, right? Mm -hmm. The same hemiplegia, meaning to, an inability to move one side of the body. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, you would in some cases have loss of sensation also, right? So then the sensation, the, the patient may report a feeling that that side is dead, right? right. It's heavy, dead, so that will be interpreted as, uh, you know, of course, the primary problem is in the vata, but there is also possibly a kapha problem. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes patients will report burning, right, abnormal sensation. Uh -huh. that, that would then be uh, translated as there is an accompanying pitta derangement along with the primary vata. So the symptomatology is used to decode the uh, the dosha. I'm of course uh, saying it in a very simple manner. Right. So I'm just, it's it's not it's not just vata, pitta, and kapha. There are many more uh, layers and dimensions to the diagnosis. Uh, which, which, yeah, yeah, which needs years of studying it to be able to do, which I can't. Right. Uh, but this is simplistically, this is how, you know, even though it is primarily a vata problem, there are uh, from the symptoms they will also infer there are additional derangements along with it gotcha gotcha so yeah again those three those three are not the the one and all of how ayurveda works but to to kind of help listeners along this journey a little can you try for your best to see to explain the difference between vata um 
Kafa, and the uh, all those three that you've mentioned now, can you give a little bit of a distinguishing factor to each that when we go through this, they'd you know be able to follow along? Happy to, happy to. So um, let's start with Kafa, right? Kafa is the are all the processes associated with growth, with mm -hmm. lubrication, with um, um, yeah, that that would be the that would be the main thing. So, uh, so for example, uh, the and again, these things apply also to different phases of the of life, mm -hmm. different seasons, mm -hmm. different uh, parts of the day. They apply to um, to uh, across various time scales. It's very interesting. And when I'm saying they apply, what I'm saying is, um, for example in the early part of life, so when one is very young and in that growing phase, the kapha is very active, right? That principle is active. Mm -hmm. uh, it predominates. Then when you reach adulthood, during that phase, pitta predominates. Then with age, right? When one becomes a senior citizen, then the vata predominates. So, or it becomes prominent. Mm -hmm. So, so that way, um, same way in in a in a day from when sunrise occurs, the first one third of the day ha is um, the, the vat. Sorry, the kapha tends to be mm -hmm. prominent, and the next phase is the pitta phase, and the evening is the vata phase again. Same thing again at night. It's divided into three. So every and uh, this happens with the seasons. So it's uh, all, all processes, you know, all of life is governed by these uh, sort of, you know, uh, waxing and waning of these different doshic influences. Right. right. Um, and now coming back, what do they each represent? So kapha, as I was telling you, represents the growth. It also re represents lubrication. Mm -hmm. um, the second was is pitta. Pitta represents... See, they have, I'm, I'm giving you some, just one or two terms, but they have a lot of implications. So if you're talking of mental processes, kapha has certain, um, certain, correlates. yeah, if you talk of digestion, it has certain correlates. If you talk of, so every, everything each of them has, but I'm just giving it very briefly. Right. Pitta, on the other hand, um, has to do with metabolism, meaning, um, generation of energy right. and uh, use of that energy um and if we are talking about mental processes it has it goes with determination um you know getting getting the getting to the goal goal directed um, and right. yeah uh, kapha tends to be sort of inert uh, slow to start mm -hmm. but very sustained right and then you look at vata Vata is movement, especially is Vata. Vata also has many other characteristics, um, you know, uh, dryness. As I said, Vata is associated with old age. So you, you can think of, um, you know, several other things. So, um, yeah, and if it's, it's also movement. So it's also quick thinking mm -hmm. that also grasping things quickly. That also uh, is a Vatic feature. So... Oh, so that dynamic process of, again, movement or, again, that intelligence. Causes that part of the brain to um, die of lack of oxygen. And that we call a stroke. It doesn't matter what the manifestations are. If mm -hmm. that affects the motor system, which mm -hmm. controls movement, causes that part of the brain to um, die of lack of oxygen. And that we call a stroke. It doesn't matter what the manifestations are. If mm -hmm. that affects the motor system, which mm -hmm. controls movement, then you will have paralysis or some abnormal movements. Uh, if it affects the speech area, then that would be still called a stroke, but they may not have the deficits in movement. They may just have difficulties with speech. So you understand what I mean uh, in that manifestations may be different. Right. Now, in Ayurveda, however, 
Pakshadhata is the diagnosis. And it doesn't matter how that is caused. Mm -hmm. So, um, another example would be multiple sclerosis, right? That yeah. can also cause hemiplegia, that is weakness of one side of the body. Mm -hmm. However, when we see a patient with weakness of one side, we are um, fully focused on trying to figure out what, what is the um, uh, cause. And yeah. we, we, we treat, you know, that, that determines treatment. So obviously that, that is what we focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, but Ayurveda will first classify it as Pakshaghata. Then they will say, was this a sudden occurrence or was this a slow occurrence? Mm -hmm. Was there fever, you know, various things about what else characterizes that. And then treatment is prescribed for those different things. So the, the categorization becomes different. Whereas somebody who has just a loss of speech from stroke right. would not, you know, be called pakshaghatta in the sense of they have not lost that moment. So there are differences, therefore, in these kinds of classifications. Um, so I hope that right. kind of... Um, no, no. The difference Again, with, with Western medicine, we look a lot in terms of the severity of each symptom. And based on that severity of those symptoms, we then decide to classify it in each category. And it really opens up what each condition is, or it makes it a lot messier. But again, with Ayurveda, it's again trying to look at the problem, look directly at the source there, and trying to synthesize that whole history. So no, that's a great explanation. Thank you so much. Um, moving forward let from... Let me give you... Yeah. Sorry, uh, let me just tell you one more thing while we are on the topic of Paksha right? right? So, um, although, I, as I told you, it is considered a disease of the Vata dosha. Right, but uh, you can have, uh, and very often it is not just one dosha which is, uh, you know, deranged. Mm -hmm. There is often a contribution of uh, the other doshas too. So the way they would look at it is so sometimes when you have stroke, right, mm -hmm. the same hemiplegia, meaning to, an inability to move one side of the body. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, you would in some cases have loss of sensation also, right? So then the sensation, the, the patient may report a feeling that that side is dead, right? right? It's heavy, dead. So that will be interpreted as, uh, you know, of course the primary problem is in the vata, but there is also possibly a kapha problem. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes patients will report burning, right? Abnormal sensation. Uh -huh. That that would then be uh, translated as there is an accompanying pitta derangement along with the primary vata. So the symptomatology is used to decode the uh, the dosha. I'm of course uh, saying it in a very simple manner. Right. So I'm just it's it's not. It's not just vata, pitta, and kapha. There are many more uh, layers and dimensions to the diagnosis, which, which, yeah, yeah, which needs years of studying it to be able to do, which I can't. Right. Uh, but this is simplistically, this is how, you know, even though it is primarily a vata problem, there are, uh, from the symptoms, they will also infer there are additional derangements along with it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, again, those three those three are not the the one and all of how Ayurveda works. But to to kind of help listeners along this journey a little, can you try for your best to see to explain the difference between vata, um, kapha, and the uh, all those three that you've mentioned now? Can you give a little bit of a distinguishing factor to each that when we go through this, they'd you know be able to follow along? Happy to, happy to. So um, let's start with kapha, right? Kapha is the are all the processes associated with growth, with mm -hmm. lubrication, with um, um, yeah that that would be the that would be the main thing. So uh, so for example, uh, the and again these things apply also to different phases of the 
of life, mm -hmm. different seasons, mm -hmm. different uh, parts of the day. They apply to um, to uh, across various time scales. It's very interesting. And when I'm saying they apply, what I'm saying is, um, for example, in the early part of life, so when one is very young and in that growing phase, the kapha is very active, right? That principle is active. Mm -hmm. uh, it predominates. Then when you reach adulthood, during that phase, vitta predominates. Then with age, right, when one becomes a senior citizen, then the vata predominates. So, or it becomes prominent. Mm -hmm. So, so that way, um, same way in in a in a day from when sunrise occurs, the first one third of the day ha is um, the vat. Sorry, the kapha tends to be mm -hmm. prominent, and the next phase is the pitta phase, and the evening is the vata phase again. Same thing again at night. It's divided into three. So every and uh, this happens with the seasons. So it's uh, all, all processes. You know, all of life is governed by these uh, sort of you know uh, waxing and waning of these different doshic influences. Right. right. Um, and now coming back, what do they each represent? So kapha, as I was telling you, represents the growth. It also re represents lubrication. Mm -hmm. um, the second was is pitta. Pitta represents, see, they have, I'm, I'm giving you some, just one or two terms, but they have a lot of implications. So if you're talking of mental processes, kapha has certain, um, certain, correlates. yeah, if you talk of digestion, it has certain correlates. If you talk of, so every, everything each of them has, but I'm just giving it very briefly. Right. Pitta, on the other hand, um, has to do with, Metabolism, meaning uh, generation of energy right. and uh, use of that energy. Um, and if we are talking of mental processes, it has it goes with determination. Um, you know, getting getting the getting to the goal, goal directed. Um, and right. yeah, uh, kapha tends to be sort of inert, uh, slow to start, mm -hmm. but very sustained. Right. And then you look at vata. Vata is movement, especially is vata. Vata also has many other characteristics. Um, you know, uh, dryness. As I said, vata is associated with old age. So you you can think of um, you know several other things. So um, yeah, and if it's it's also movement. So it's also quick thinking. Mm -hmm. That also grasping things quickly. That also uh, is a vatic feature. So, oh, so that dynamic process of again movement or again that intelligence, and they depended on the on the local healers to actually treat them uh, for these problems when they arrive. So, uh, um, coming back, the the challenge therefore is to undo these um, several hundreds of years of um, you know stigma uh, associated with Ayurveda, saying it's superstition. It's 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 a, a a very deep deep knowledge system, right? And people who, who without bothering to look at it, simply say, "Oh, Ayurveda, all oh, that is superstition." You know, that's um, they're doing it a great disservice. I mean, you 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 should really look at there are there is such a huge you know uh, literature on that. You know, people for over. Hundreds, thousands. I mean, we don't have all those manuscripts, but because uh, you know they were not published in paper, um, and certainly they didn't have computers. So, um, but of even of what we do have, there is so much. You know, uh, people, the original writers, and then the people who came after them writing um, explanations of explaining the previous textbook. Right. You know, like for generations where people were adding on to it with their own experience and writing about, about these things. It's it's amazing. And we don't realize that it's such a huge um, knowledge system that exists. But I think now the awareness is improving. Right. Um, and what we need to do, so 
here's you know the same thing happened with yoga right mm -hmm. um it it was uh, it was something that you know people who were very uh, uh, you know somewhere um, were considered these are very backward superstitious or, or whatever right. uh, you know people who would practice things and then it has finally you know become such the the wonders of yoga are still being discovered I and mean, it's it's such a powerful tool for maintaining health for um you know including mental health which is hard to do with with no real side effect so right. uh, the same way as I, I think it's inevitable that it's going to uh, really um, come become big uh, on the but at the same time one should also be careful because there is a lot of uh, what shall we say um, appropriation of traditional knowledge so a lot of this happens where uh, traditional knowledge systems the knowledge from those is taken and repackaged with no reference to the original and then presented as somebody else's discovery and right. this has happened a lot with indian knowledge systems and same thing could happen and i would say perhaps is happening and has happened with ayurveda too in in small ways but we should be careful to um to minimize develop ayurveda in a way that yes that it you know it is still connected to the original source and um due credit is given to the original sources right and that that's one thing that i'd love to follow up on because one thing i've noticed is if you do a quick google search and you search up ayurveda it's very clear and which ones are a repackaged simplified version of ayurveda and which ones actually have that material and that deep understanding of the doshas here because again you look at google or anything else you can't really trust those sources just because they're the first one to come up so as we wrap up today i just want to uh, ask for the listeners again if they want to learn more about ayurveda what would you recommend if you could on where to at least start on or how to even think about it so that in their own life they can start trying to practice ayurveda or you know become more in tune with it yeah there are um there are a lot of uh, good books on Ayurveda. Um, wow. And there are also, um, in the US, there are many Ayurvedic um, schools or let's say training um, programs run by different organizations. Uh -huh. And many of them offer, um, you know, this for the lay person, they offer Ayurvedic wellness um, courses. So that's sort of the first course that people take, you know, it may be six months or something. And they, um, you know, for example, every weekend for six months, something like that. Right. And that's where they learn about basic Ayurveda and how to live according to Ayurvedic principles. So that is usually the first introductory course. People who then want to go further, then learn further to become an Ayurvedic health counselor, for instance. So there are um, certification programs for Ayurvedic health counselor. And then there are the Ayurvedic MD programs as well here also. Um, there are a few. But uh, depending on where you live, um, you know, there are several, I would say, um, there are several uh, well-known um, Ayurvedic institutions in India that have branches here and so when you go to those or you learn from somebody who has trained at one of these reputed well-established institutions in India then you know you're getting the genuine um, you know Ayurvedic knowledge Perfect. from there. So thank you, uh, Dr. Archanaji. I just want to ask you one final question for our listeners here. If they'd want to start incorporating Ayurveda into their lives to some degree, I know we've mentioned before that it's difficult to really find a resource online because of that repackaging. But if they want to start getting more involved, get it as part of their daily life and start going down that route, how would you suggest they start making those changes in their lives? Sure. So... Um... With Ayurveda, right, um, one of the key things is actually diet, um, which I didn't mention. So 
diet is really important in Ayurveda and, uh, you know, it, you, it reminds you of the um, saying that food becomes you. Have you heard that? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. we are, uh, we are fo- uh, the food we eat, our bodies are that. So um, Ayurveda really um, prescribes a lot of uh, do's and don'ts and um, when to eat, how to eat, um, what to eat, of course, but besides all the other things also, uh, you know, how much water you should drink, when you should drink um, the water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so food and diet is a very good place to start. Now, how would you know? Um, you know, there are good books on Ayurveda one could read, and depending on where you live, it's very likely that there is some uh, in in at least in the bigger cities, most of them where there there is a significant Indian population, you will find Ayurvedic um, treatment centers, but also those that provide uh, training. They provide uh, sort of um, you know short courses on Ayurvedic wellness and how to live life healthily with Ayurveda. So you could start with one of those if you're um, interested uh, and use first do the diet and then there's you know other things sleep um how much exercise you should do Uh, in you know again this is contrary to what modern medicine says but ayurveda i don't think modern medicine has looked into it enough but ayurveda is very clear Uh, everybody should not be doing you know all out going all out for exercise so exercise is recommended but Depending on your own physiology, your prakriti is what they call it. That is, that is the predominance of different doshas varies among people. That that's what gives people different natures, right? Some are very fast, some are slow, some are uh, irritable, some are very calm. I mean, so all of this is related to the predominance of different doshas in your body, right. and so based on on that. There is, you know, what you, not everybody, all all dosha types are not advised to do the same amount of exercise. Mm-hmm. So uh, there can be too much of a good thing. Uh, in, and um, so there are many of these things that one could learn and one could easily incorporate into one's life. Right. Now, if it comes actually, if you have a problem that you need Ayurvedic, uh, you want to try Ayurvedic treatment for, uh, then again, I would recommend, you know, making sure you go to somebody who has trained sufficiently is, um, you know, many of the, there are many very good Ayurvedic uh, medical colleges in India. So, mm-hmm. uh, and we have a lot of graduates from there uh, in the U.S. too. So learning, uh, um, going to one of them for treatment. Um, now, a common question that people have is, you know, I'm on Western medicine prescribed medication. Should I is it okay to take Ayurveda at the same time? Right. Again, we don't have studies. We don't have research studies that have looked at this that are saying, well, uh, can what happens if we combine them? So uh, use sort of common sense. Be cautious. Uh, do not suddenly stop uh, all your, you know, Western yeah, um, right. medicine right. prescriptions. Um, you know, talk. And usually even the Ayurvedic practitioner will not advise that you stop uh, everything. So, you know, you would start gradually and then uh, if the condition gets better, then you might be able to sort of reduce the other um, other Western medicines. Again, under the advice of your Western doctor as well, because if you're getting better, they'll be able to see that and they'll be able to also take that off. So this is one question a lot of people have and we don't have any um, enough data to say what exactly one should do and besides that would also differ depending on the problem one is one has perfect and then one final thing i'd like to ask to just touch back up so when you mentioned diet and food that is one thing that they could focus how does that you know dieting is a part that people are starting to recommend in western medicine too so i'd want to ask how does that differ when it comes to ayurveda if we want to you know start incorporating that into their lives how would that diet is there's things that yeah. you include herbs wise or anything how would how would you recommend yeah so um 
there is a there is a saying at, and um, you know it has to come uh, this is for, uh, in um, sanskrit so uh -huh. although i don't know specifically of what uh, ayurvedic uh, if it is in a specific ayurvedic text but this is sort of a, a often quoted so it has to come from the same ayurvedic um, knowledge system oh, right yeah and that says langhanam parama aushadam that is fasting is uh, a great medicine. So uh, wow. fasting, is, as you might know, is part of normal Indian life, mm -hmm. um, irrespective of, uh, um, you know, which uh, part of India or which group you know, um, your specific beliefs or ways of worship, uh, all faiths in uh, that come from the subcontinent that originated there, they all practice fasting regularly. Um, and this is supposed to be very important to keep you healthy. Now, again, depending on the, the prakriti of the person, the cons it, it would roughly translate to constitution, the doshic constitution of the person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the extent of fasting also uh, is, uh, can may not be um, the same for all, meaning the recommended amount of fasting. So right. um, some some prakritis can go for prolonged periods with nothing at all, you know, just complete. This is what people do with intermittent fasting, 16 hours, right. and they don't eat anything. They do it every day, actually. Um, but there are other prakritis for which that would not be advisable. Right. And that may act be uh, harmful. So Ayurveda is very, th there's almost nothing that's uh, that's prescribed to everyone. Very few things are there which are commonly good for everyone. But everything else, the degree varies as to depending on the so individual the person. It's a very individualized kind of medicine. That That's the important thing about Ayurveda. Right, that individualized experience. So again, difficult to really say, here's this diet, here's the schedule to follow. But again, if we find those resources, love to share those. And then from there, we can tell the listeners here. But thank you so much for your time and for sharing this with us today, Dr. Arjunaji. Thank you. You're most welcome, Abhi. Right. Right. I must say to all your listeners and those who are watching too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Abhi Curry for ending our first episode here of Health Beyond Borders. Thank you guys so much for listening on Radio Nera. And please continue to tune in for our next episode as we keep exploring other forms of medicine and trying to see how we can improve here.